Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello, I am Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and through it we seek to be drawn closer and closer to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to the Heavenly Father. And we know that that is all accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is indeed our counselor, our teacher, our guide, our advocate, and uh, it is through him that we are drawn closer uh, to our God. And it is through the Holy Spirit that the Heavenly Father reveals his word to us. And so we are so thankful for that. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. It is indeed a beautiful day that you have made, and we certainly give you thanks and praise for the rain that has been falling. I don't know how widespread it is, Heavenly Father, but we sure thank you for it here um, in Alice. Uh, we do appreciate it. I know the crops appreciate it, the, the ranchers and the livestock and everybody, we just appreciate it. And so we just thank you for that. Thank you for the blessing of rain. We also lift up to you the people all throughout this, um, this nation that uh, has a little bit too much water or has had too many storms. And we just ask you, Heavenly Father, to have mercy. Have mercy on these people who live along the Mississippi. Have mercy on the people in southeast in the southeast states of the United States so ravaged by tornadoes. Have mercy on us, Heavenly Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday we were reminded of the need to always, and I mean always, check out our ideas with God before we assume that our ideas have God's stamp of approval. David, he truly had it in his heart to build the Lord a house where the Ark of the Covenant could be placed. Nathan, a prophet of God, he readily agreed with David, saying, Surely the Lord is with you. But neither David or Nathan asked the Lord what his thoughts were on such a thing. Within hours after David had voiced his idea and Nathan agreed with him. The Lord told Nathan that David was not the one who would build a house for his name. One of David's sons would have that assignment and that responsibility. As it was, David being a warrior, he simply had too much blood on his hands. So the Lord prevented him from carrying out his plans. We also heard yesterday how David made good the promise he had made to Jonathan to show continual kindness to Jonathan's family. The only son left to Jonathan was his son Mephibosheth. David gave back to Mephibosheth all the property which had belonged to Saul. And David gave orders to Saul's steward Ziba, as well as to Ziba's sons and Ziba's stewards. Uh, he gave orders to them to farm the land belonging to Mephibosheth so that Mephibosheth could always be provided for. As for Mephibosheth, he was going to live in Jerusalem and eat daily at David's table like one of David's sons. If we recall, Mephibosheth, uh, he was lame in both feet because he was dropped at the age of five and his feet were affected uh, when his nurse dropped him upon hearing the, the tragic news of the death of Saul and Jonathan. And so he was lame all of his life and so David was caring for him. Now, we ended our time yesterday um, by beginning to hear the record of David's huge mistake uh, of committing adultery with Bathsheba. Now, there is just a whole lot for us to learn from David's mistake, and so it is to that story that we now turn. I'm going to read through it first, and then I'm going to go back over it, making comments. And so this is found in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men. 
and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him back to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as I live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobbesheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open. But we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Absolutely, the thing David did displeased the Lord. David was a man whom the Lord described as a man after his own heart. How then could someone for whom God thought so highly of make such a mistake? Here's how. David took his eyes off of the Lord. The first thing David did that was not in keeping with his position, his duty, and his responsibility as king over Israel was this. He didn't go off to war. 
he remained in Jerusalem. Because he remained in Jerusalem, he had time on his hands. Oh, what would he do with all the time that he had on his hands? Now, I am most certainly not saying that David didn't have the right to send Joab, his commander, to fight the Ammonites, because he had that right. However, David was a warrior. He was used to being engaged in battle. He was used to fighting the enemies he could see. But the enemies he could see weren't the ones that were coming after him in this case. In this case, the enemy coming after him was a much more cunning foe. The enemy was internal. The enemy was his own flesh and the temptation which so often originates there. Absolutely, every one of us is faced with temptation. It's what we do with it when we are tempted that matters. And there really are only two courses of action we can take when faced with temptation. We can resist the temptation or we can fall for it. And if we fall for it, we sin. Now people may argue with me and say that there are more options than the two that I have just given. After all, isn't there a whole bunch of gray area between the absolute black and white of resisting temptation or falling for it? No. There really are only two choices for us when we are faced with temptation. If we resist the temptation but then continue to mull over it and let the temptation marinate in our hearts, it is almost certain that eventually we will fall for that temptation. As the writer of Proverbs said, as a man or even as a woman thinks in their hearts, so they are. Another way to understand this proverb is this. We are what we think. It is for this reason that St. Paul urged the people of Philippi to think about whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Sometimes falling for a particular temptation takes time because, you know, our consciences must be become dull. At other times, falling for temptation can be quite sudden. In this case, David actually had time to turn away from sin, but he chose not to do so. For a moment, David's fleshly desire for Bathsheba took over David's heart. David, the one described as a man after God's own heart, took his eyes off of his Lord, and when that happened, he fell into sin, and then he fell even into more sin. You see, the one thing that we know is that sin multiplies. That is its character. Sin multiplies. We saw how quickly sin multiplied in the Garden of Eden. Eve, when tempted, didn't turn away from the temptation. She thought about it. She let the thought of eating the forbidden fruit marinate in her heart. And once she sinned, she invited Adam to join her in her sin or in the sin. Then when God confronted Adam, Adam blamed the woman. And he also blamed God for the trouble he was in. Eve blamed the serpent. And guess what? The serpent didn't have a way out. Just because the serpent didn't have anyone to blame, however, doesn't get the woman or the man off the hook for sinning. No, Adam and Eve knew the command and what the consequences would be for disobeying God's command. But they did it anyway. They sinned anyway. Now let's consider how David's sin multiplies. In fact, it just snowballs. David's first sin was that he looked upon that which he ought not have looked upon. David had wives. He had lots of them. So what was he doing? As he gazed upon Bathsheba, David was taking his eyes off of the Lord. And once he took his eyes off of the Lord, he was then vulnerable to all sorts of other sins. His second sin was that of coveting Bathsheba. She, he wanted someone who belonged to another man. And that, in and of itself, should have stopped him, but it didn't. His third sin was that he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then his fourth and fifth sins, well, they're kind of combined in that he murdered Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, through, you know, through enemy means. And then he took Bathsheba to be his own wife. In other words, he stole another man's wife. Oh, now, David made it look like he was a very good guy. Bathsheba was pregnant. Her husband was dead. 
how nice of David to marry this poor pregnant widow. Right. David could possibly have fooled everyone in Jerusalem, but he could not fool God. And what David did displeased the Lord, and God cannot be mocked. We reap what we sow. Let's hear now how the Lord confronts David through Nathan the prophet. And this is found in 2 Samuel 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Ouch. Ooh. David, well, he had been given much by the Lord. The Lord had done much for David, and this is how David repaid the Lord's kindness and generosity to him. Yes. David would reap what he had sown. His indiscretion was going to cost him big time. What David does next, however, um, after being confronted by the Lord through Nathan, is an example for us to learn from and imitate. When Nathan exposed David's sin, David's response was, I have sinned against the Lord. Yes, indeed, David had sinned, and he admits it. He didn't try to pass blame onto anyone else or justify his actions or excuse them. He simply admitted his guilt. David deserved to die. He had indeed committed adultery, and the penalty for adultery was death. But then David hears from Nathan something he did not expect to hear. The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Now those must have been beautiful words for David's ears, except that those beautiful words were followed by some very difficult words words which were these. This is what, how Nathan, what Nathan said, however, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed from his house. And the Lord struck the child. Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor would he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass the child died. 
And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now this is actually very difficult to hear that a child would die. The child is not guilty, and the child is not being punished, yet David's sin does have its consequences. The child conceived and birthed as a result of adultery was not going to be allowed to live. But we are now going to hear of an amazing thing that God will do to show how completely he had put away David's sin. And so we read further, then David com uh, comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the, na by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now isn't this amazing? Solomon, also known as Jedidiah, was the second son of David and Bathsheba, and out of all of David's sons, and he had many sons prior to Solomon's birth. Out of all of those sons of David, God tapped Solomon, the second son of David and Bathsheba, to become king over Israel after David's death. And this is exactly the nature of forgiveness. Yes, sometimes there are severe consequences we must live with after we have sinned, but forgiveness makes us right with God, so right that God will bless us in ways we do not and could never deserve. The key to receiving such forgiveness and grace is this. We must admit our sin. We must confess the wrong we have done. We must repent of such sins we commit. We should not ever return to them. And last, but certainly not least, and I mean that certainly not least, we must put our trust in Jesus and in the precious blood he shed in order that we might be cleansed of all sin and guilt. Before I continue reading 2 Samuel 12, let, let me read the, the psalm David wrote after Nathan had confronted him of his adultery. That psalm is Psalm 51. It's a beautiful psalm. And this is what David wrote. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know your wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. 
Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good, in your good, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. May we, with the help of God, refrain from sin. But should we sin, May we be quick to confess our sin so that we might receive the forgiveness Jesus purchased for us through his own precious blood. But let us not treat the sacrifice of our Lord lightly nor contemptuously, for it was out of great love for us that God sent his Son into the world to accomplish for us that which we could never have accomplished. And that was and is reconciliation with God and the salvation of our souls. This is where we are going to stop today. And let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for the day. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have recorded for us in uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12 a devastating uh, sin that David committed. He was wrong. But you forgave him his sin. He said, I have sinned, and you forgave the guilt of his sin. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would in this way be like David, that when we sin, we would admit it and not cover it up, but we would admit it and go humbly before your throne of grace and ask for forgiveness. Cover us, O oh Lord, with the blood of your Son, and we thank you for that. Make us white with that cleansing. You know, bringing to ourselves, enjoying ourselves that wonderful promise that Isaiah wrote about, that though your sins may be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. And so, Heavenly Father, I lift these uh, people up to you, and I bless them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer, and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.